Hi, I'm Sarah Campbell. I currently teach English at Ketchikan High School in Ketchikan, Alaska. I've taken a variety of NCTA seminars, workshops, and participated in study tours that have inspired me to create an Asian literature course for high school juniors and seniors. This class app is one of a series on strategies for using art in teaching Asia at the secondary level. Today, I would like to demonstrate how I'd use Seshu Toyo's iconic Buddhist landscape painting as an entry point to teaching medieval and modern Japanese literature. I'd like to first use our time to talk a little bit about the medieval Japanese tales. Next, I will demonstrate the questioning techniques that I would use with students to help them read the picture in order to then better understand Buddhism. And finally, I will present some classroom literature pieces as well as activities for you to use with your students. I first learned about medieval Japanese literature through a teaching East Asian literature workshop at Indiana University. Setsuwa Bungaku translates as spoken story or tale literature. Initially, these folk tales were part of an oral tradition, and just like many cultures around the world, these setsuwa also consisted of myths, legends, and fairy tales that were passed down and shared in the form of oral narrations. It is believed that these tales were compiled or written during the Heian through Kamakura period, so roughly 8th through 14th century in Japan. And while the exact authorship of these tales is unknown, Buddhist monks are credited with the collections we have today. There are literally hundreds of tales to choose from. A resource that I've had success in using with students is visible on your screen. It's Royal Tyler's Japanese Tales. This collection contains 222 tales. And at the bottom of the screen, you'll see in the citation that I've included four of my favorites. Later in this presentation, I will focus specifically on tale 107. It's called The Grateful Crab. I'll share some ideas and teaching strategies that you can use with students for this tale. These tales are pretty simple and straightforward. They're short. Some of them are about a paragraph long, others are maybe a couple of pages, which is probably why my high school students really like them. Um, plots are concise, characters are developed through action and dialogue, and they really don't lend themselves to close reading or a lot of textual analysis. But they will provide students with an understanding of medieval Japanese culture, as well as a better understanding of the Buddhist themes in Japanese literature. So now back to Toyo's landscape painting. I often use art as an entry point to introduce abstract concepts with my students. What I would like to do with this piece is use it to introduce Buddhism if your students are like mine, they probably don't have a very good understanding of the teachings of Buddhism. They might say that they've seen a monk or they can identify a Buddhist temple, but they really can't articulate the goals and teachings of this religion, which then is going to make reading literature later on pretty difficult. So what I'd like to do is share some questioning techniques that I'd use with students and as I ask the questions, go ahead and be the student and construct some responses for yourself. Okay, are you ready? Here we go. So, when you look at this image, what do you see? What's the focal point? What's the first thing that catches your eye? Okay, let's take a closer look to read the picture. What I'd like to do is divide the image into four quadrants along an x-y axis, just like in math class. What do you see in quadrant one? Quadrant two? Three? And four? Students will make note of the trees 
the mountains. They'll tell you that it appears to be snowing or it's a bit foggy. As students look closer after asking them to break it into quadrants and really look at the picture, they'll start to notice a path and the village with the houses in it. They might even notice that there's a human walking on the path. And in looking at the image for a little while longer down there in the bottom right hand corner, some might even notice the boat, which then will make them conclude that beyond those rocks lies a stream or a river. Some of the students will be really uh, apt to explain that the man seems teeny tiny in comparison to the trees and the mountains, and they'll probably ask you why. It's almost as if the artist was making a mistake here. But then this might segue into additional questions. You could ask your students, how are people interacting with their environment? What do you see that makes you know this? You could also ask students how they feel when looking at this particular picture. Of course, responses are going to vary here. Um, and in the past, when I've used this image with students, they said that it makes them feel sad, lonely, isolated. Some even say it makes them feel calm and a bit peaceful. The final question I always ask students um, is, if you were to give this image a title, what would it be? I like to ask this question as a way to help bring students to a conclusion about the observations they've been making about this picture. When I've asked in the past, students have said things like, uh, Asian village, or a quiet solo journey, or simply man in nature. So now how can the students' observations and conclusions about Toyo's image then be used to help define Buddhism? I'd recommend you start by expanding on the titles that students generated during the questioning session, because more often than not, students' titles will articulate the basic goal of Buddhism. They just may not know it, and it's your job to help them make the connection. So let's take that title, Man in Nature, for example. Man is part of nature. He feels connected, yet maybe a little disconnected. The man on the path appears confident, calm, a bit insignificant by comparison to his awesome surroundings. But man here is free from desire, competition, and conflict. Tell students that their reaction to Toyo's painting have really explained what Buddhism is all about. Buddhism is about being enlightened and achieving enlightenment. It's all about having a close connection with nature and practicing self-realization through that meditative-like connection. And how better to do that than by being man in nature. I hope you see now how Toyo's painting can be used as an anticipatory set to then spark students' interest and better prepare them for the direct instruction on Buddhism that will follow. I'd recommend at this point you provide students with a basic overview of Buddhism, specifically addressing the goals and teachings of this Eastern religion, since students are going to need this as a foundational piece to then later read the medieval and modern Japanese literature. At the end of the presentation, I will share a link to a resource page that will contain some helpful information on Japanese Buddhism as well as the specific information addressed in the next few, few slides. So what is the basic goal of Buddhism? It's to achieve enlightenment. Zen Buddhism emphasizes uh, individual meditative practice as means of achieving enlightenment. And again, think of that man on the path. He seems to be in a pretty good state of mind to do this. 
The basic teachings of Buddhism um, can be explained and understood in the Four Noble Truths. It is believed that life is suffering. Suffering is caused by craving and by desires, but the suffering can have an end, and the end to all of that suffering is by following a path. The ultimate goal of Buddhism, of course, is to end suffering. And this religion offers the spiritual path for transcending um, the suffering of existence, and it's known as the Eightfold Path. You see it here on the slide in front of you. Right understanding uh, means that you understand the Four Noble Truths. Right speech translates as you say the right thing. Uh, you don't speak ill of others. Right livelihood means that you perform a job that is helpful, not harmful, to others. Right concentration focuses in on self-responsibility and focus through meditation. Right mindfulness is that your attitude must be determined to end your selfish ways. Right effort, you must try to improve yourself. Right action is doing things to help people, not hurt them. And right intention is that you must be determined to follow the Eightfold Path. When it comes to reading medieval literature or the Setsua, certain themes will reappear. And again, the information that I'm going to go over on this slide will appear at the end of the presentation on a resource page. So in reading these medieval tales with your students, you might want to first preview them by talking about these Buddhist themes that they might encounter. And the first theme that students will see is that of reincarnation, which is how you acted in one life determines your status in the next cycle. The next theme that will appear is karmic retribution, the idea that one's moral choices in life have consequences. And if you act morally and just, well, good moral things will happen to you. But also, if you're immoral, well, <laughs> you might have some bad karma to follow. Students really identify this almost with the golden rule, and they tend to really easily identify karmic retribution in the stories. The third theme in Buddhist literature that you'll find is the impermanence and mutability of all things. Um, things change so much. They're not permanent. So the idea behind this one is to relinquish desire, to give things up now, and then you won't suffer later on. The final theme is salvation through devotion to Buddha and Buddhist doctrine. So in the stories, you'll see people reciting sutras and pledging their devotion to Buddha in a variety of ways, all with pretty positive outcomes. As I mentioned in the beginning, one of my favorite setsua is called The Grateful Crab. This is tale 107 in Royal Tyler's book. I love this story because it begins with this young, pious girl. She's devoted to the canon uh, sutra, and she recites um, the sutras daily. Canon, I should mention, is the god of compassion and mercy. So this young girl is so pious and so compassionate that one day at the market, she sees a crab about to be killed. Rather than let the crab die, she chooses to buy it, and then she sets it free. The tale goes on to then talk about this girl's dad, who is out in a field, and one day he sees a snake about to eat a frog. He tries to reason with the snake to let the frog go, but of course the snake won't have anything to do with that. He wants to eat the frog. So the man, desperate to free the frog, says, Hey snake, if you let that frog go, I'll give you my daughter. The snake quickly disgorges the frog. Then later, as expected, uh, the snake arrives at the man's house, demanding the daughter, as he was promised. The father's a bit shocked, but he manages to get the snake to go away and says, come back in a few days. This way, the father will have time to prepare his daughter for what's about to happen. 
So a few days later, the snake does come back and he goes straight for the man's daughter. The snake slithers into her room, beats on the door with its tail. All the while, this poor girl is desperately chanting the canon sutra. A little canon, about a foot tall, appears to the little girl and says, Don't be afraid. Don't worry. This tale does end quite beautifully for the girl. In the middle of the night, hundreds of crabs invade the house. They attack the snake and they tear it to pieces. So remember that crab that the girl took pity on in the very beginning of the tale? Ah, you see now. See, her compassion for that crab is exactly what ended up saving her in the end. I like to read these tales out loud to my students, and then we can discuss the different Buddhist themes that they see. So, in this little tale of the grateful crab, do you see reincarnation, karmic retribution, impermanence and the mutability of all things, or salvation to the Buddhist doctrine? Students will quickly say that they see theme number two. Is this correct? Well, there is some karma here, how if one acts morally, then positive moral outcomes will follow. The young girl helped rescue the crab, and she devoutly recited her Buddha sutras, so she was certainly moral. Is there another theme here? What about number three, mutability of all things? By relinquishing desire, or the father offering up and sacrificing his daughter to save that frog in the field, he ended the cycle of desire for love, the love of his child, only to help another creature. So by relinquishing what he loved the most, his daughter, he ends up transcending suffering. And certainly students could make a case for Buddhist theme number four, salvation to the Buddhist doctrine. That young girl demonstrated such devotion by fasting on Canon's special day and reciting the sutra. And those virtues are exactly what ended up saving her in the end. So as you can see, this is a simple little tale, but it really will give you and your students a lot to talk about. Buddhist themes can also be found in modern literature. Akatagawa is a famous modern Japanese short story writer. He's credited with Rashomon. You might know that one. Uh, and in this particular slide, I'm wanting you to know about The Spider's Thread. It's a short story that was written in 1918. And what Akatagawa does in The Spider's Thread is he kind of puts a modern spin and he rewrites an old Japanese tale. The tale, I'm going to summarize it for you just briefly, uh, begins with Buddha. And Buddha is in heaven. And he's, you know, having a lovely day. And he's smelling the lotus flowers. And he's looking into this pond. And as he looks into the pond, he can see all the way from heaven all the way down into hell. And Buddha spots a man who he knows. It's a robber. He's a notorious robber. And he's committed horrible crimes in his life, which is why he ended up in hell. But Buddha also remembers how this particular robber showed compassion one day to a spider, and he let it go. So Buddha decides to show some compassion to this robber. He throws him a line, so to speak, and casts a spider's thread all the way from heaven down into hell. So of course the robber spots this spider's thread at once, and he decides to climb on and try to, you know, get out of hell. So as he's climbing on this long thread all the way up, all the way up, all of a sudden the robber notices that other sinners who were at the bottom of hell have joined in the climb. The robber gets greedy and selfish and doesn't want to help the others to climb out. This is his thread. Just at this moment... Buddha sees the robber's lack of compassion for others, and the spider's thread breaks, <laughs> leaving it so that the robber, as well as the other sinners, fall all the way back down into hell. 
again with students after reading this, I would ask them to identify which Buddhist themes they see. Again, karmic retribution stands out. If the robber had not acted immorally, he wouldn't be in hell in the first place. We also see, though, how acting in a compassionate and kind way is what allowed Buddha to throw the spider's thread down into hell to give the robber a second chance. These themes are really fun, and they do appear, and of course there's more than one correct interpretation. What I like to do after reading a variety of the medieval tales, and then after reading Akutagawa's The Spider's Thread, is then ask my students to write their own Buddhist tale. I ask that students in writing their own tale clearly communicate at least one of the Buddhist themes. They can have the creative freedom to set their tale in contemporary times if they'd like, but I want to make sure that they communicate one of those Buddhist themes. It's really fun to see what students can come up with, and I'd recommend that you try it out. Another favorite short story of mine is by Natsumi Soseki, and this is called The Third Night. There are various translations of this story, and at the end, on a reference page, I've included three different translations for the same story, and I'll talk about here in a little bit an activity you can have your students do with these various translations. But first, let me give you a little background of the third night. Um, the main character in this piece has just killed somebody. He's committed a murder, and of course, this is weighing heavily on him. He wrestles with accepting the consequences of what it is that he has done. This main character um, is walking on a path, and he actually has a child on his back that he's carrying. So he's carrying this heavy load, he's walking on this path, um, and he's internally struggling with the murder that he's just committed. As the story progresses, uh, the child on the back actually starts to morph into something else altogether and not a child. And what's really fun is to look at how the different translators of this story uh, describe this thing on this guy's back. In some of the translations, it starts as a creature. Um, the thing on his back, which is a child, is described as a bump, um, a blind brat, or even an incubus. Although this main character's walk uh, doesn't really seem that long, he's walking on a path, it really actually becomes almost unbearable. And what's unbearable about it is that he has committed this egregious act, this immoral act, um, and what really is communicated to readers is it's not easy to get rid of. So again, you could read this story with your students for its Buddhist messages, and just like with the past two stories, you can have some discussion on which of the Buddhist themes they see. But then, as I talked about, there are various translations, and it would be interesting to focus in on certain lines or passages by the different translators and figure out which one has the strongest tone. Look at the word choice and how specific words might create an image in the reader's mind. With the combination of the word choice and the syntax, what message is communicated? It's fun to have students look at different translations and then make a conclusion about which one has more of a stylistic impact on their reading. The final modern short story that I'd recommend that you use with students is called The Bears of Name Toko. This piece is written by Miyazawa Kenji, and again, I would focus on the Buddhist themes presented in this particular piece, um, as well as the main character's ability to adhere to the Eightfold Path. The Bears of Name Toko um, begins with personifying a mountain. Um, there's a main character, and he lives in the mountains, and his main job is he hunts. He hunts bears for a living. And all of these natural elements, the hunter, the mountain, and the bears, they're all connected 
in such a way to show readers clearly that one should be kind and in balance with nature. The hunter, at the beginning of the story, really has respect for the bears he kills. He hunts the bears because he has to. And for most of the story, he doesn't apologize for his livelihood. But as the story goes on, he begins to wrestle internally with the merits of his profession. On this slide, you'll see a chart. And it really allows students to define and identify the elements of the Eightfold Path presented in Miyazawa's story. What I like to have students do is evaluate the different choices and decisions um, made by the main character to then determine whether or not uh, he adhered to the teachings of Buddhism. By doing this, students are making a conclusion about Buddhism, about the choices that the character makes, and then fully really understanding uh, how important it is to be in tune uh, with nature so that one can achieve enlightenment. For access to discussion questions, um, links to the resources I've discussed in this presentation, and some more background information on Buddhism, please access the link on your screen. I hope you find as much enjoyment as I have in incorporating medieval and modern Japanese literature into your classrooms. Thank you.